show your support. Follow me on Twitter. Hello, I am that British guy and welcome to the Raw After, where I look at the Raw episode after a historic pay-per-view. And this time we will be looking at the Raw After Invasion. There have been a lot of videos and opinions by various people over the years um, regarding the invasion itself. But there hasn't been too much actually looking at the immediate after effects of the pay-per-view. There have been a bit on the Raw beforehand where the old Stone Cold came back and sort of saved the WWF from the Alliance in that beatdown at the end. But obviously after his turn at the end of the show in the inaugural brawl, giving the win to WCW and ECW, there's not a lot has been said on the immediate after effects of that. This obviously led to sort of a few months worth of, of pay-per-views before the invasion was finally sort of ended at Survivor Series in another 5-on-5 five -five match where The Rock ultimately won for the WWF and then we got the return of Ric Flair and the unification of the WCW and WWF titles and, and Jericho becoming the first undisputed champion which then kind of led to the brand split going forward because the roster was so bloated so they kind of split them between Raw and Smackdown this was kind of the the first step towards that you saw a lot more uh, use of the WCW guys on a week to week basis rather than just kind of running in and costing guys matches there were sort of more stakes in, in their matches and they were really trying to sort of weave them into weekly television oh, at least that was the, the intention certainly at the beginning and by the end you just kind of had WWF guys fighting WWF guys but they just kind of turned to the alliance by the end, so many uh, former WWF guys had turned over to the Alliance that it really wasn't anything to do with WCW and ECW besides Booker T, DDP a bit, Rob Van Dam, um, and I suppose on the ECW side, most of them were just former WWF guys that immediately reverted back to ECW, the likes of Raven and Taz and the Dudleys. There wasn't really any proper involvement for the the main WCW guys that they had left or the ECW guys either. So anyway, let's get started looking at the Raw After Invasion. So we start off before the episode properly begins with the same video package that we got at the beginning of the Invasion pay-per-view but they kind of splice in the very ending of the show with Austin uh, dragging a referee in because Angle has got the ankle lock on Booker T and he's tapping and just as you think he's going to kind of revive the referee so that Angle can get the win he stunners him puts Booker T uh, on Angle and gives the win to the Alliance. And obviously at the end of that we get JR's infamous WHY DAMN IT WHY sentiments. He is on commentary with Michael Cole which for me it never really worked because I suppose it did in context of, of this storyline because they were both very much backing the WWF and they were seen as the good guys here. Um, it's just a bit weird to hear shows without any real kind of proper colour to it. Uh, anyone kind of really trying to be the advocate of any of the heels in any matches. But I suppose historically it does sort of make sense because the Alliance were never ever going to get kind of a, a fair deal here. They were never going to be seen in a positive light. Every single one of them was uh, a huge heel in, in terms of the, the storyline. And because they were kind of brought in at the, the request of Vince McMahon because of this storyline, they were never really going to get uh, their own voice. So it, it does sort of make sense in that respect. 
the show opens proper to huge amount of pyros on like pay-per-view levels almost of, of pyros I can't remember whether this was a a weekly thing back then or whether it was just kind of because this was the biggest thing in wrestling at the time and the invasion pay-per-view although it's been seen historically as a, as a massively negative uh, storyline because there wasn't the likes of um, the NWO, there was no Goldberg, there was no Sting, there was no Jeff Jarrett, there was no Scott Steiner, these huge names, especially for WCW. As I say, the ECW guys, most of them were with um, the WWF at the time anyway, um, besides Tommy Dreamer and the Sandman and those sorts of guys, but they they had RVD in here, they had Rhino, the last champion, they had Raven anyway, they had Taz, all these huge sort of w, uh, ECW uh, alumni, if you like. But there was none of that from the WCW side, so you had DDP and Booker T, and that was it, really. So yes, the story was seen as, as kind of negative overall, especially as those big guys, apart from Sting, kind of turned up in 2002-2003 anyway when their contracts uh, with Time Warner were expired. The pay-per-view itself was very successful. It did a huge amount of buys, a uh, number on screen now, and made the WWF so much money as well that at the time it was massively successful, so they were kind of riding high on that. Uh, the fact that this was in uh, Buffalo, New York as well, obviously, they were going to get a huge uh, WWF kind of backing there as well. The show itself properly kicks off with a very, very long, tiresome promo, starting off with Stephanie McMahon, uh, moves on to Shane and Paul as well, before, Paul Heyman that is, before ending up with Stone Cold, and he is basically upset that Vince McMahon has been showing too much sort of fondness to Kurt Angle and he's paranoid that um, he's going to be groomed to be the next champion. He brings up The Rock as well, the fact that um, McMahon is kind of on the phone every week to The Rock to try and get him to come back. And that is ultimately why Austin turned his back on Vince McMahon and the WWF and everything to do with the company because he felt underappreciated, he felt that he was being overlooked and that he was going to be ousted, which kind of was how he was feeling actually. It was very interesting that these sort of sentiments were kind of being voiced here when that that is kind of the way things were starting to go for him. He he knew that I suppose with the neck injuries that he had that he didn't have that much time left um, competing at the the top of his game, and because of Jericho getting much bigger and at the time being a babyface, obviously you had the Rock. Angle was starting to be seen in a positive light, especially since this um, alliance invasion. Obviously, pretty much everyone in the WWF was then seen as, as baby faces. He was kind of seeing himself slowly kind of sink down that, that level. Um, the Undertaker had kind of had a bit of a resurgence, coming back as um, the American badass type character. So, I think he was genuinely feeling quite threatened at the time um, and that's ultimately why he left sort of 18 months later because there was sort of no real significant future for him anymore and that was I believe at the time the ultimate reason why he did go through with the heel turn thinking that well if I can't be the top baby face then I'll have to be the top heel um, obviously he turned initially at uh, Wrestlemania X7 and kind of joined forces with Triple H and then with Triple H becoming sidelined due to injury he was then ultimately ruling the roost at the top of the card on the hill side of things and then obviously this reaffirmed that um, at the Invasion pay-per-view. This draws Kurt Angle out and they get into a bit of a scuffle but when Angle kind of looks like he's getting one over on Austin, Austin bails from the ring and kind of leaves 
with um, the rest of the Alliance kind of management members uh, with the title as well leaving uh, Kurt Angle kind of soaking up the crowd in the ring. Our first match is between Matt Hardy, the current European champion, and Rob Van Dam of the Alliance, who is the new Hardcore champion. He won the belt from Jeff Hardy the previous night in what is probably the best match of the show. It was a very, very good Hardcore match, uh, without being too kind of weapon-heavy, really. It was still a very, very good wrestling match with a few spots with some kind of ladders and chairs and bits and pieces which you can kind of expect from those guys and that kind of cemented him I think in the eyes of many as somebody that when this all completely blew over um, just make him babyface again and he can have a decent run certainly to, to begin with in the upper mid card and then potentially moving him up into the main event which they ultimately did probably about two or three years later than they should have done but this kind of put him um, in in the mindset especially of WWF fans who hadn't been exposed to him too much because of his history just with uh, ECW at the time this is a pretty good TV match to be honest it's sort of a cut down version of what RVD and Jeff did at the pay-per-view um, ultimately with Rob Van Dam winning again with this time with the um, five star frog splash on top of Matt who is kind of sandwiched in a ladder the night before he did it with a chair on top of Jeff Hardy and yeah, this was probably the one and only time in the show where uh, an Alliance member was shown in a really strong and positive light. Although there were other victories for other guys, there was a lot of kind of shenanigans going on. But this was just a clean, well, as clean as you can get in a, in a hardcore match. But there was no ref bumps, there was no distractions. He just used the, the environment and the weapons to his advantage and managed to get the win over Matt Hardy and retain the hardcore title so they were really putting over the fact that the alliance um, had the they won the hardcore title but they now had ownership over the WWF title because of Austin's um, betrayal and this kind of starts the the collection if you like of uh, the Alliance collecting WWF belts and then what happens in the kind of later weeks um, and certainly by SummerSlam and, and then the months after of the WWF kind of getting one back on the Alliance and winning some WCW belts back. Really interesting that there's no mention of any ECW belts at all as far as I can remember. There wasn't any in the Invasion pay-per-view and there certainly wasn't any in this night. I've recently watched the SummerSlam the month after and there was no mention of any ECW belts there either. So if I'm wrong on that, please call me out in the comments if there are any particular episodes where that is addressed. Um, but it was just kind of something that was never really brought up as far as I'm aware. We get a quick backstage segment between uh, initially the Dudleys and Edge and Christian. Uh, and then Booker T is brought into the fold and they set up the, our main event for this evening a six man tag team elimination tables match the Dudleys and Booker T who at this time is still the WCW champion and United States champion and they will be facing Edge and Christian and a third partner and we find out who they pick for their third partner a little bit later on our next match is another title match for the Intercontinental title. The champion Albert of X Factor, so he's teaming up with uh, X Park still at this point, and he is facing off against Lance Storm. And this is basically Lance Storm being ragdolled around by a big guy until the end where there is distractions aplenty. I believe it's Mike Awesome comes in and distracts the ref. Uh, x Park tries to then kind of even the numbers before Hugh Morris comes in and clocks Albert with the belt. Lance Storm then hits him with a super kick and wins the Intercontinental Championship. 
And so now the Alliance have three WWF belts. The only belts the WWF have got of their own uh, kind are the European belt, the light heavyweight belt, and the tag team. Oh, and the women's as well, but that's kind of not really... Because there isn't an equivalent WCW belt, it's kind of pushed aside and, and kind of forgotten about, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, the, the only ones that they really pay any credence to are... Well, you've got the tag belts, which are kind of okay, I guess, but then other very low-tier belts. Um, obviously, we know how little the World well, Wrestling Federation cared about the light heavyweight slash cruiserweight division um, as opposed to how WCW thought about it, certainly uh, in a higher regard, if you like. And this also kind of paints the overall picture, although the Alliance were able to get wins here and there, and certainly on this night were equal in terms of wins losses. In fact, I think they might have even won one more match tonight. Uh, and obviously they did at the inaugural brawl as well. Uh, sorry, at the invasion pay-per-view as well. It's only through kind of sneaky means, apart from Rob Van Dam, it seems. After a few more backstage segments, including a section with Chris Canyon and uh, DDP, and ending with William Regal kind of spurring up Tajiri, and his match next against Raven. And you know, they were trying to play up the whole fact that Tajiri has remained loyal because he was kind of involved in ECW with the likes of Raven and Rhino and Taz and everyone, but he stayed loyal to William Regal and the World Wrestling Federation. He now faces Raven next. And Raven the night before actually managed to pick up a win over William Regal, again thanks to Taz, so again it wasn't a clean win. And this is sort of William Regal trying to exact some kind of revenge on Raven by sending his uh, protege, if you like, uh, Tajiri out to kind of best Raven. This was a pretty good match, to be honest. It was more kind of catered towards Tajiri, his hard-hitting style. Raven got a few bits in here and there, but it kind of was a, a bit of a Tajiri spot fest, really. Um showcasing his hard-hitting style which was quite nice to go back to seeing that obviously that was kind of the the Japanese style that he'd picked up when he trained before that he brought over with him and kind of was one of the first people to really try and do that within the WWF certainly at the time anyway um, and it still sort of holds up pretty well today. Raven is a very, very good foil for anyone anyway. And Tajiri manages to actually exact some revenge over Raven and kind of gets that win back for William Regal in a nice hard-fought match with a pretty decent clean finish. Surprise, surprise, the WWF win in a clean finish. Next up... After being kind of psyched up by Paul Heyman, Rhino, the last ever ECW champion, comes out and he is facing off against The Undertaker, who comes out with his then-wife, Sarah. Now, they mentioned that the only reason she is there is because of the whole DDP stalking uh, angle and the, the safest place for her to be is by Undertaker's side because if he knows where she is then he can kind of keep an eye on her and make sure that she's always protected which when we get to after the match is proved completely invalid. The Stalker storyline um, wasn't really mentioned that much in the Invasion pay-per-view. I know there were a few times when uh, Undertaker kind of gave DDP a bit of a pummeling, but they didn't really make it particularly obvious as to the, the real history between the two of them and how long it had been going on for and just what uh, DDP had been doing to kind of torment Sarah and The Undertaker. It was quite interesting as well that, um, I don't know whether it was because obviously DDP was in that inaugural brawl match, but Sarah didn't come out to ringside with The Undertaker and Kane on the previous night so clearly being beside the undertaker is not always the safest place to be because she would have been there last night but hey ho there's nothing like some inconsistency in my wrestling 
This match is basically The Undertaker pummeling Rhino. Uh, Rhino does try and hit the gore a couple of times, but is always outsmarted, uh, ramming into the uh, turnbuckle, and also eating a big boot as well. But The Undertaker pretty handily dispatches him, even though towards the end DDP comes out and kind of is really slowly and awkwardly chasing Sarah around ringside. And when it when he came out, I kind of thought, oh, well, that's obviously what's going to distract The Undertaker for Rhino to gore him and pin him or whatever. But he kind of, he pins, he chokeslam and pins Rhino whilst watching DDP walking around outside the ring, chasing Sarah really slowly. And only when the match is finished does he then bail from the ring and start clobbering DDP. Um, after a bit of beating him up on the outside of the ring, he throws him back into the ring and gets a chair. And this is Sarah's opportunity to start uh, beating down on DDP in the corner. Undertaker tries to kind of peel her away a couple of times, but she keeps going back in for a few more kicks. He manages to kind of separate the two of them, and DDP uses this opportunity to get the chair. And you think that he's going to use this distraction, if you like, to pummel The Undertaker, but The Undertaker just lays him out with another fist. Basically, this was DDP just being completely manhandled, and that's all this kind of mini storyline was. He ended up getting beaten up by The Undertaker on a weekly basis. He even lost to Sarah. Um, I'm not sure if that was at a pay-per-view. It might have been just on a, a episode of Raw or SmackDown, but he was in a match against Sarah and got destroyed in that as well. Uh, come SummerSlam, he was the tag champions, I believe the WWF tag champion, with Canyon, and The Undertaker and Kane were the WCW tag champions, and that was a unification match, and it was a cage match as well, and he got his ass handed to him then as well. So that's essentially all he was brought in for, certainly in the early stages, he was brought in to just be cannon fodder for The Undertaker to beat up on a weekly basis. And just as The Undertaker is about to attack him with a chair, DDP drags Sarah in the way and she gets hit in the back. And he then kind of makes good his escape. Next up, we have the match between Chris Jericho and Chris Canyon. And earlier in the night, in his new t-shirt Chris Canyon had, his Invasion MVP, who better than Canyon, on the back of it. Um, he basically was going around saying that because he only just won a six-man tag uh, that they had earlier in the Invasion pay-per-view, if he hadn't have put in the work to win that, then they would have lost, uh, even though they'd won the inaugural brawl, they still would have lost 6-5, and the whole Invasion would have been a complete disaster, so that is why he was the MVP of the night. Completely overshadowing, obviously, Steve Austin, which annoys him le earlier on. And this is kind of fuel for Jericho to kind of play to the crowd and basically say, well, that guy over there, you're better than Canyon, and, and you're better than Canyon, and she's better than Canyon, and everyone here is better than Canyon. And this obviously brings Canyon out to interrupt him. It's a pretty decent balanced match. Um, I hadn't really seen much of Chris Canyon other than at the Invasion pay-per-view. He kind of then, uh, with so many of the other WCW mid-card guys, kind of petered out as this storyline went on. I don't know if he was picked up in the kind of brand split. I don't seem to remember him featuring much because it was kind of this and, and then the Ric Flair coming back and then the Vengeance pay-per-view. That was then when I sort of started watching more on a a week-to-week -week basis as much as I could and kind of catching up with um, the, the monthly pay-per-views a lot more often. So, I, yeah, I don't really remember him featuring too much after this period. Uh, as I said, he was the tag champion with DDP, but ultimately lost that to The Undertaker and Kane. And I think that was kind of when he just sort of started petering out more and more on a, on a weekly basis. But from what he showed here, he was pretty capable, to be honest. And it's a shame that he was never really given a proper opportunity to have a go at sort of the European intercontinental belts. Maybe 
even in a kind of a long term tag team with somebody but he was like so many of the WCW guys that weren't Booker T pretty much um, they were just kind of thrown to the wayside unfortunately ultimately Jericho is able to win this match he tries a lion salt towards the end and Kenny gets the knees up but after a, a little kind of Back and forth then uh, he locks in the walls of Jericho and Canyon taps out. We then get the arrival and in-ring promo of Vince McMahon and he is kind of very dishevelled and downtrodden. He realises that the acquisition of Austin was uh, a huge blow to the WWF and that we essentially we have nuclear warfare and if they're going to go so far as to take the WWF champion and title away from us, then the only thing that I can do, really, in order to try and level the playing field is to lift the suspension of The Rock and ask him to come back, not for me, not for the WWF, but for the people. And it's really babyface Vince at his best, really, using another popular superstar to really pop the crowd as much as possible doing all of Rock's mannerisms, uh, his catchphrases, mentioning the, the eyebrow and laying the smacketh down and everything in order to get that positive reaction from the crowd for The Rock to I think at the time that the crowd were kind of hoping that The Rock was going to make an appearance there and then but the, the more the promo sort of built on, you you knew that all he was doing was kind of offering that olive branch out to him and saying, please come back, we need you, I need you, but more so the people here need you, we need a new leader um, in order to kind of beat down this invasion. And ultimately that is what happens, The Rock does come back, Obviously not tonight, but he does come back and wins at SummerSlam. In the main event, he wins the WCW title from Booker T. So we have the the WCW title in the WWF camp, and we still have the WWF title in the Alliance camp. So you kind of have that balancing out, but it then effectively becomes Rock versus Austin, McMahons versus McMahons, and that is sort of the beginning of when most of the other WCW guys just kind of disappear into the, the background really, apart from Booker T and RVD, funnily enough. Next up we have a spanking match between Tori Wilson and Trish Stratus. And you could tell that JR could not care any less about this match. Cole mentions it earlier and JR's like, well now I've seen everything, but if I'm being honest I'd rather see our main event. And it is just a paddle on a pole match, basically. Get the paddle and whack your opponent with it. Um, the in-ring work is pretty awful. Even Trish at this point wasn't great. There was a tag team bra and panties match the night before that Lita and Trish won over Stacy and Tori. And this is basically Tori getting a win back. It's... Other than the RVD match, it's the cleanest win that the Alliance get all night. Uh, but it, yeah, it's just Tory getting a win back from the night before. It's really short, it's really pointless. It's quite awful to watch in terms of the actual in-ring work that the two of them do. And, well, here we are 17 years on and I'm sure that Extreme Rules we will not be seeing uh, Alexa Bliss versus Nia Jax in a spanking match for the Raw Women's title. Thank God. Right, it is time for our main event and earlier in the night we got a couple of skits. One between Edge and Christian uh, finding their new partner and that being Kurt Angle. Basically saying, look, I know we've had our problems in the past but we're all WWF, we all fought hard last night, uh, we want you on our team against the Dudleys and Booker T, what do you say? And Angle agrees to that and um, it, that's kind of when the, the match is made official. It's going to be the Dudleys and Booker T versus Edge, Christian and Kurt Angle in the main event. 
A little bit later on, Angle catches up with Vince backstage after his promo and basically says, look, you don't need The Rock. Like, I'm glad he's coming back because, excellent, he can really help us out, but you don't need him to be the leader. I can be that leader. I will be, in the absence of Austin and everything that he's done and the fact that we haven't got The Rock back yet and we don't know for definite if he's going to come back and join our side, I will be your leader. And Vince very kind of cleverly plays up the whole action speak louder than words element just to fire Angle up um, before this match, which it very much does. Obviously, with it being uh, an elimination match, we know that at least three guys um, from one team are going to be going through these tables, if not uh, more guys. And the story of this is basically isolating Angle so that he is working on his own. Once Edge and Christian get put through tables right near the beginning, he's kind of having to work off the crowd and fire himself back up and really show that he is that leader that he said he was in order to kind of come back from the dead, if you like, in order to vanquish the what are essentially the masters of the table match in the in the Dudleys and the WCW and United States champion in Booker T, a very formidable foe. Funnily enough as well, the guy that actually pinned him the previous night, albeit with a lot of help from Austin. And just as Angle is kind of bringing himself back into the match, looking like he could potentially win it, out comes Austin and costs him yet again, allowing Bubba to put Angle through the table and lay him out. This kind of starts up more of a one-on-one a -on -one rivalry between Austin and Angle, which does lead to a match between the two of them at SummerSlam as well, uh, where they go one-on-one -on -one for the WWF title, for Angle to try and bring the belt back. Ultimately, he is unable to do so, purely because Austin is just constantly running away from him and using any kind of cheating tactics that he can to... Uh, escape with the belt which he does do there but this kind of cements Angle very much as a solid babyface hero for the WWF side of things um, and valiantly coming back from seemingly against all odds only to be beaten by uh, Austin coming in and inserting himself into the match and effectively making it a four against three and costing Angle the, the match there. After the Alliance kind of ending the invasion on a high, having gained the Hardcore and the WWF title because they kind of turned the, the champion, here it's sort of more of the same. They're able to acquire the uh, Intercontinental title. They're able to lay out the wife of what is JR puts over as kind of the heart and soul of the WWF in The Undertaker, so that kind of sends him reeling. Yes, we might be getting a return of The Rock, but we're not sure. Angle, as the new kind of hero of the World Wrestling Federation, has been completely laid out in this match as well. And it's sort of more of the same of the Alliance looking as strong as is physically possible, um, although it would have been more physically possible for them to look stronger by actually having them win matches cleanly, um, and by matches, I don't mean a bloody spanking match between what was effectively, at the time, two non-wrestlers, uh, especially on the part of Tori Wilson, who didn't even really want to wrestle anyway. She was just still kind of a model. Um, but hey-ho. But I suppose credit to the way they booked it. At least they were giving the Alliance wins. At least they were giving them belts. Um... I think ultimately trying to build them up in a stronger fashion at the beginning in order for when they're then overcome towards the end by sort of Survivor Series, it made it that much uh, a bigger deal. Even though when we came to Survivor Series, the uh, five man of the Alliance consisted of um, Angle, because he then actually turned, because that makes sense, uh, Austin. Uh, Rob Van Dam, who actually was part of the Alliance, 
Uh, Booker T, again, who was part of the Alliance, and they were really the only two guys that ever went anywhere after this. Funnily enough, one of them becoming World Heavyweight Champion and the other one becoming uh, a WWE Champion a few years down the line. And the fifth guy being Shane McMahon. So you've got five guys, two of which were... WWF or former WWF champions or current ones in Austin and Angle, one of which being the son of the owner in Shane McMahon who kind of technically was still a non-wrestler even though he'd won a couple of belts and then two guys, two guys, I mean the inaugural brawl was bad enough the fact that they had the Dudleys and Rhino in there who although they were ECW historically they, they were really at the time uh, the first people to turn on the uh, World Wrestling Federation and kind of align themselves with the Alliance. So you only had uh, Booker T and DDP from WCW side of things. So it was a bit wobbly anyway, so for them to get rid of most of those guys and, and only have two, it just kind of shows ultimately what, uh, what happened with the, the Invasion storyline, unfortunately. So that was the Raw after uh, the Invasion pay-per-view. We had a few good matches in there. The Matt Hardy, Rob Van Dam was pretty good, although it was quite short, and you'd probably be better off watching the Jeff Hardy, Rob Van Dam hardcore match from the Invasion pay-per-view. Tajiri Raven was an okay um, TV match. The main event was very good, and the ending kind of made sense in the overall story that they were telling. Uh, just kind of played up Austin more as this conniving, cowardly heel character, and really showed Angle in the best possible light. It's just a shame they then turned him later in the story, which effectively nullified all of this hard work that they were doing. But in a bubble, it was very, very good. In the grander scheme of things, I suppose they are trying to put in these kind of smaller storylines, um, smaller sort of ripples between the WWF and the Alliance uh, certainly where all the mid-card titles were kind of concerned and they then kind of did bring in unification matches for all of those um, over the next sort of weeks and months just to kind of phase out the WCW belts mainly it got the beginning of the reintroduction of The Rock coming back after his filming with The uh, Scorpion King and The Mummy Returns. And it laid those initial foundations certainly for the two main title matches at SummerSlam the following month. So at the time it was sort of making a little bit of sense. Uh, it's just a shame the kind of ultimate payoff never really, um, never really paid off. Next month on the Raw After, we will be looking at the Raw After SummerSlam 2004. But until then, I have been that British guy, and I will see you very soon.